uh, one of the interesting things I get to do as a journalist, uh, as well as uh, doing news and events, is I get to see the various Silicon Valleys around the world and get to put them in perspective. Uh, so uh, this year, London, Silicon Roundabout, New York, Silicon Alley. Uh, what are the, what's the name for the Hong Kong startup scene? Anyone? Happy Valley. <laughs> There we go. Well, I think we're still in the early days, though, of the, this whole startup sphere in, in Hong Kong. So I, I think, um, you know, Hong Kong needs um, the success stories that some other markets have had, like Silicon Valley with, with uh, you know, Facebook, Google, and, and so forth. So I think uh, we're going to, we're seeing a lot of energy with uh, all these startups getting off the ground and an angel investor community developing and, and the VC community right behind that. And I'm encouraged by uh, what I see here in Hong Kong. It's one of the reasons that we brought Silicon Dragon to Hong Kong and organized this program. Uh, the idea behind this program is uh, from startup to scale. So we've structured the program uh, to give you an idea of the various elements uh, from going from ground zero to, to startup to IPO or to M&A. And we're going to try to uh, give a little bit of, of, of a flavor of each one of these milestones along the way for startups. Um, and I would like to welcome to the stage um, our first tech chat, uh, which will be between Vicky Wu, the co-founder of Zhao Zhao, with uh, Napoleon Biggs, the founder of Web Wednesday, who's also a, a, a parallel entrepreneur with Inspire Digital Asia, and I'd like to welcome them to the stage. And uh, the reason we're starting with them is that Vicky's uh, startup is really, really new. So we're going from very early stage startup and moving right along to later stage startup. So Vicky and Napoleon, would you please come up? And e each one of these tech chats will be about 20 minutes. And we'll have a little bit of time for a very directed, pointed Q&A uh, after each one. So I'll let them um, have a very conversational chat about uh, Vicky's entrepreneurial story. And um, I'll turn it over to Napoleon to uh, moderate. Actually, uh, I spoke at Napoleon's Web Wednesday group last night, and it was great fun. So I know you're in for a treat with him as a moderator. Pressure. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Hello, yeah. So we, I'm lucky enough to interview the youngest person in this room, uh, which is good. So tell us, uh, uh, Vicky, uh, I understand you were a, a trained neuroscientist, is that right? That is correct. I studied neuroscience in college. So how are you finding that's helping you start a, a tech startup? Um, What's the link between neuroscience and uh, what you're doing now? Um, well, aside from getting me to Asia. The turning point was probably the summer of my sophomore year. I went out to India. It was my first taste of Asia to do a surgery internship. And we did some back surgeries. We worked in a slum in the middle of India. And then afterward, because China was right next door, I came over here for the first time to the mainland. I taught English there. And that was really the first time that I fell in love with the region. And so the summer after that, summer of my junior year, I was determined to come back and in a more corporate capacity, of course, because I wanted a different sort of work experience. And so that's when I ended up interning in investment banking. I ended up um, receiving a return offer to, actually it was my ticket back to Hong Kong, which was a job at Goldman Sachs. So I stayed there for two and a half years. And so you went from being a hippie doctor to a <laughs> banker. And then you saw the light and became a tech entrepreneur. Is that, is that how it works? Well, I worked in finance for two and a half years. And eventually, that was the platform from which I launched into startup world. So why, why did you choose Hong Kong? You, you were educated in the States, right? So and you were in, in, why didn't you start up in Beijing or Shanghai? Well, having been here for two and a half years, we, my, part, my business partner and I, who She's also based in Hong Kong. We had built our networks solely upon being in Hong Kong. And when I say Hong Kong, that extends to Beijing. It's, it extends to Shanghai, extends all over Pan-Asia. So tell us what you're doing. What is your startup? What is the nature of the business? So Zhao Zhao is a crowdfunding platform that connects emerging designers in Asia with shoppers around the world. So if you're familiar with crowdfunding platforms, it's like a Kickstarter for fashion, if you will. 
And are you finding the, the designers are here? They're, they're in China, or, or you don't care? They come from all over the place. The designers are based in Asia, and from what we've, from all the 400, 450 designers we've spoken to, most are Hong Kong, just because we're here, but also Singapore, Taiwan, some mainland China, although we're holding off on that, and parts of Southeast Asia. So are you like a mini VC? Is it, how, how does the crowdsourcing work exactly? So in terms of crowdfunding is platforms... Thunder? Is that lightning? Drama. <laughs> Excellent. We're a reward-based platform. So yeah. what that means is actually shoppers or funders, if you will, come onto the site and you can pre-order items. So people like you and I, we go onto the site, I like this necklace, I want to pre-order one item. So each project gets 29 days, a 29-day window to hit that target, after which in an all-or-nothing campaign, they're deemed either successful or they're not successful. But how do you decide the products, whether they're good or not? Are you, are you, do, do you play an editorial role, or you just let anybody? Is it Havoc? Is it like Taobao? It's not like Taobao. Right. We are a curated platform, meaning not everyone and their mother can upload projects. So my partner actually handles the designer curation bit. And out of all of the designers we've interviewed, we've actually only selected maybe 10% to go live onto the site. So tell us a little bit about your partnership, because I understand you know, you told us your background, but you're not a fashion person, right? You're a trained banker, doctor, slash hippie, <laughs> right? So what, what is your role of your partner? How do you, why did you partner up, and what's the partnership? How does it work? So I met my partner three and a half years ago when I first moved to Hong Kong, when I was a banker. And a mutual friend introduced us and said, Vicky, you know, you should really speak to this girl. She'd be a good friend for you. You'll turn into a horrible person if you only hang out with finance people. And so we became friends. We kept in touch. And she was a buyer at Gucci. So she hooked me up with really sweet discounts. That must discounts. be a hard person to have as a friend, a buyer at Gucci. A um, banker or a buyer at Gucci? I understand. So we kept in touch. And Sometime in the middle of 2011, we were throwing ideas around casually, and her sister at the time was a student in fashion school. So one of the things that she often lamented about, and her, we later on did surveys of her classmates, was you know, after these students graduate from fashion school, where do they go? You know, if they don't get that coveted job as a buyer or you know, at Lane Crawford or IT, one of the big brand names, then they basically have to work for the man, so to speak. And so we thought of this platform in conjunction with you know, the recent fascination with crowdfunding platforms at that time to combine into what we have today. But with, with social media, why would a, a fashion designer want to come to you? Couldn't they just set up a, a blog or a Twitter account or a Weibo account and become independently famous and sell their <laughs> products that way? How are you going to help them? I mean, I know in Singapore, for example, you have this blog shop uh, phenomenon, right? Where people just source design stuff and they get a commission for selling it. So how, how are you, what's the value you offer to a designer, given that they could just go nuts on social media? Well, we encourage that, because actually our idea is predicated on the fact that these individual designers each have their own social media channels. So actually, let's say we have a designer who sells jewelry from India, and then we bring on board another designer from Taiwan who does, you know, I don't know, um, headbands. So we have the traffic that's driven independently from this Indian designer cross-pollinated with the traffic driven from the Taiwanese designer, and bam, we've sort of you know, created this aggregate platform, this place where everyone can go and share ideas. So how are you recruiting? You've got the designers. How are you telling the buyers? How, how are people aware of the fact that they can come and invest by design? So that's the million-dollar question of customer acquisition. We've mm. been exhausting every avenue of free advertising, be it Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Polyvore, Instagram. We're on everything. Um, and which so one works? So far, I would say Facebook works the best. Any investors in Facebook in this room? One. <laughs> He's a journalist. <laughs> so Facebook works better than the other channels you find? Facebook works most of the time, Instagram, so they work for different, different things. Facebook works to generate interest, generate buzz. LinkedIn works to you know, attract potential investors. Instagram works to attract potential designers. So I come to your site. I like uh, a necklace. I give you $40. What do you do with my money? You as the site, not the designer. As the site, we'll hold your money, and we won't charge you until those 29 days are up or until all of the target pre-orders of that project have been fulfilled. 
So you hold the money on escrow until the, it's delivered to me. So are you responsible for the delivery or are you just responsible for the, the nice picture that I see on your website? So delivery is handled by each individual designer. So you're not taking any the risk of the logistics or any of that stuff? That is correct. And how are you going to make money? We take a commission. Of? Of the total funding target. Okay. So how many projects have gone through? You've been alive how long now? We've been alive since September 26, 2012. Okay. So that's what, six, six months? Six, seven months, yeah. And how much business have you generated? So we have funded a total of 35 or 36 projects. I think one might have got funded last night, so. Excellent. Thank you. And what was it? I think it was a necklace. A necklace. <laughs> Same one I invested in. So tell us, um, how are you, there's a few finance people in this room. Are you, how are you financing this? Are you bootstrapping it? Are you borrowing money from rich friends? Are you tapping into your university alumni friends? Have you got some friends back in India? That, where, where are you getting the money from? So we have one angel investor, private investor, and then we're also part of the Hong Kong Science Park incubator program, um, Incu app, which provides some funding support. And do you find that was helpful? Was that a strategic decision? I will go into an Incu beta program, or do you just think, I need some space, it's kind of up north, it's closer to China, I'll go there. What, what, how did you decide on that? Um, You're not going to answer that. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. So d how did you build it? Did you, you're not a tech person. She's not a tech person. Did you source, did you crowdsource your building? Did you go to Odesk or whatever it's called and, or no, freelance.com? How did, did you not, find your programmer? We did programmer? not use those websites. We actually have had, we outsourced the initial prototype, but actually we've had somebody who was a primary tech contact since day one. So in the beginning, I actually went to Hong Kong um, University of Science and Technology put on a Jansport, put on my vans, and stalked a bunch of students uh, in the tech department. And we ended up, I interviewed four or five, and we found one that was really good. And he stayed with us for about eight months um, and worked for free. And are you, relying, are you relying on people who come, are you finding people who come to your website mostly through desktop, or is it all going through mobile? There's a lot of talk now about mobile commerce, especially in fashion. What are you finding is happening with the buyers of your, the investors, I suppose? We're seeing most of it through desktop. Through desktop, yep. from any particular country. I mean, you're, you have global ambitions, right? So are your global ambitions America? Are your global ambitions, what, what are your global ambitions? So what's interesting is actually half of our traffic comes from the US and from Europe, which we had not anticipated. We haven't spent that much money on marketing outright, so we expected it to be more Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, basically Asian countries that speak English. So we are planning to expand into the States. Into the US? That's right. Are you looking for funding to expand into the US? Funding would be nice. It would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Any questions? I think that's 15 minutes, correct? Any questions from the floor? No? Ah, one lady there. Thank you, very interesting indeed. I'm interested in, I uh, don't know if it's, you can disclose that, about the average deal size of the 36 deals that you've um, helped. Um, one thing, if you would please identify yourself and your affiliation. Sure, my name is uh, Christine Chow from Advantage Ventures. I'm just uh, more interested in the kind of deals that you've helped solicited. If there's any information you can disclose, that would be um, interesting for us, thank you. Sure, so the question was, what is the average deal size in terms of projects by the designers? It really varies. So we have designers that upload projects, one to two pieces at anything from 20 US dollars to 1,000 US dollars. So really the sweet spot is about 80 or 90 US per piece. And in terms of quantity, probably five to 10 pieces. So you can do the math from there. And how are you finding your, your crowdsourcing is different from other crowdsourcing like Kickstarter and Indigo and people like that? What is your, what's different in your approach? So we're different from those crowdfunding sites in that we are pretty niche. We focus on emerging designers in Asia. So these other sites, they'll promote creativity in the avenue of photography and events and charities and what have you. But we're solely on mostly fashion, but also handbags, accessories, jewelry, basically sizeless items. Okay, any other questions? Oh. 
Is time and up? I would, no, we have, we have a few more minutes, anyone? And I would encourage uh, the audience uh, to tweet. Uh, there is wireless I, access here I have at a question. Do, do you miss your life as a banker? Huh. Is that, that's a very meaningful smile. <laughs> Not that much has Not changed. Not that much. <laughs> Interesting. And are you, are you, because we're in Hong Kong, are you seeing China as an interesting market? I mean, your sites, is it English only or is it trilingual? Or, I mean, it, you know, it's across the border. So it's a little bit closer than America. So do you That's see it right. as a market or are you terrified of copying? Well, the site, I think if something is good, it'll probably get copied anyway. So it's a compliment if you get copied. but. Yes, we do have a draft of our site in Chinese. We just haven't launched it. We don't see a point in doing that unless we have the right partners in place. Mm. So I think we're going to focus on what we know best first. And how do you convince a designer to come on board? I mean, what's your value proposition to designer? You say, you're a designer, you know nothing about business, let me help you. What's your, what's your offer? So in the beginning, we were telling designers, hey, here's a great platform for you to distribute your items, since they really just want a place to show their wares off. But at this point, designers are coming to us, and so it's not too hard to convince them to come on. So are you turning any away? We are. Based on what based on, criteria? So we choose the designers based on a certain style that we go by, mostly by my partner's taste, and also based on the quality and based on really the integrity of the designer because we are trusting. There is an outlay of risk that, you know, initially when we get the funding, let's say they are successful, we need to wire to them 25% um, of their funding. So we need to make sure they don't run away with it. And is, uh, because you're in the fashion space, is there a celebrity element? Have you leveraged the celebrity element? Typically in Hong Kong, it's the Leng Mo element that comes into anything to do with fashion. So are, are you seeing, in terms of making noise, North America, Europe, are you lever leveraging, have you got any celebrities on board to make noise for you? Or is that going to happen organically? I think that'll happen organically, but we've, we've tried speaking to some just of our personal contacts, whether it's models or you know, B-list celebrities, but I don't think that's really necessarily the way to go. And do you think you'll end up making your own jewelry in the end? Our own line? Yes, your own line. Maybe. Maybe, <laughs> potentially. Any other questions? Oh, look, more right questions. here in the front. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's me. Uh, my okay. name is Alvin yeah, Chung. You. I work for a family office based in Hong Kong, uh, investing in all kinds of investments, uh, including uh, private equity and uh, VC investments. Um, yeah. Last year, uh, we closed a deal in Japan and doing quite similar stuff. Uh, but uh, it's not just fashion design, it's design everything. Uh, their single largest uh, uh, client is Lego, and uh, as well as Groupon in Japan. In, in this industry, uh, I know there's a, a company in the States which is very large and marginalized many other competitors in the States. Um, how do you see the competition in China, in Asia? Uh, um, still, I mean, the fashion industry should be quite a niche industry and how to really uh, get the, the margins here. Um, that's my question. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Alvin. So the question was, how do we see the competition in China, in Asia, in terms of crowdfunding? and fashion. So we get this question a lot and I think yes there are a lot of pure crowdfunding platforms out there and there are definitely a lot of copycats in China and then there are also a lot of fashion websites that promote emerging designers or that do straight up e-commerce. What we see ourselves as being differentiated in is the fact that we combine the two. So like you said it is very niche and there aren't that many sites that actually crowdfund fashion particularly. So I think that's really our edge. But he made a point about uh, he's seen similar ideas in Japan. So does that mean you have to corner a market? Like, I mean, it'd be hard for you to go and get designers out of Japan, right? So you've obviously got to have your, your hunting ground for designers. It's got to be your locality because yeah. you're a small startup and there's only two of you and you're bootstrapped and so. you're in Science Park. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you must have a, like a, an immediate target map that you want to get yeah. into. I guess if we want to be specific, I would say Asia x Japan and, and maybe Korea, just because of the language barriers. So between my partner and I, we speak Mandarin, Cantonese, and English. So whoever speaks those three languages, we can speak to. And that's, that's quite a lot of people in this part of the world. Yeah. Enough people. There was another hand that went up over right here. Right here in the fourth row, middle. Good to see that you haven't lost your uh, banker roots, Asia x Japan. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm Suleiman Al Reza from Asia Investments. Um, had a question on your site. Do, do you see yourself more as a, a point of sales platform or a proof of concept? And I guess going forward, when a designer is suddenly on your platform, what is then the next step for them? So to answer your question about point of point of sale or proof of concept, I think it's it's a combination of both. But going forward, actually. We are revamping our site to become more of an e-commerce type platform. So it'll be more of a sales distribution channel for designers. And we're keeping the crowdfunding bit because that's interesting, it's novel, and you know, we want to prove that it works. But you're right, the sales part is going to be mostly the, it's going to be the, the sales generator going forward. So what happens if I'm a designer that's got successfully f uh, funded? Do I keep on using your platform? Do I start setting up a shop? I fund one product, another product, another product. Do I basically become a, a big client of yours and I have my T-Mall type? Am I, you know, is it a T-Mall of designers? Are you allowing me to set up shop on your platform? So far, it's per project. So we've had repeat designers. We've had designers that have been successful three, four, five times. And each time, they just upload a, a separate project. It's not a mall, but there is a section on the site which is currently being developed. But you know, the designer can actually, we have interviews, they can put more stories about how they produce their designs, what they're basically tell, tell their story. Because that seems to make sense, right? If you find one designer you like, you'll stick with them, right? I, I'm not a jewelry when I buy the odd piece, but if I find somebody I like, I'll stick with them. So surely I want to keep on funding. So in the end, maybe you'll just have a handful of 10 really good designers, like a collection, like Gucci. Yeah. You'll have your top designers and you'll ditch all the rest. Is that where you see it going? I don't know about ditching any designers since we're really trying to promote the indigenous local sort of homegrown talent. Um, so as long as they're good and their quality, we'll take them on. But in terms of the designers who've been repeat successes, yeah, I mean, they're, they keep on coming back. They're loyal to us. It's sort of like... Yeah, but that doesn't make sense. You make money out of the sales. So you want to increase the people who sell more, right? So if somebody comes and they don't sell anything and you've got somebody who sells as a star, sells again and again and again, you're going to go front page, top left-hand corner, right? I mean, you're going to focus on them, surely. Everyone deserves a chance. <laughs> you're democratic. It sounds right. like Napoleon should be a business advisor here. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, let's, uh, let's give a round of applause to uh, Napoleon and Vicky. I think um, Vicky makes this seem very innovative and easy, but I'm sure it's not easy at all. Um, so thank you, uh, Napoleon and Vicky. And they'll be staying around if you have any further questions for them. So uh, next, moving right along, uh, we're going to bring Frederick Balfour uh, to the stage. He's, uh, come, come along, Frederick, um, here from Bloomberg Business Week. He's going to be chatting with Yatsu from Outblaze. Outblaze is right here at Cyberport and is an example of a successful startup based here in Hong Kong. They've been through a, a number of uh, roller coaster years and have emerged strong again. And I think it's a great story to tell and that's why I invited uh, them to uh, talk about this next stage, this next level of startup and how really, you know, building from you know, startup to scale and going through the roller coaster years and, and then emerging stronger again. So I will turn it over to, to them uh, to to begin. <laughs> you can tell I'm not in tech. Okay, um, just before we start, how many people here own a hoodie? Hands up. How many people here don't know what a hoodie is? Okay, good, you came to the right place. <laughs> okay, this is a hoodie. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to, we, we've actually had a chance to, to chat a fair bit before we sat down here. Um, not only is this going to be a case study, what we also think there'll be some value added if we talk about the challenges that Hong Kong poses for people who are trying to do startups. Um, when Rebecca asked what is the, the name for our Silicon Valley and I said Happy Valley, I wasn't actually kidding. Um, you look at something like the Jockey Club, which has a monopoly here. Hong Kong always promotes itself as it, it, the freest market in the world. I think those of us, at least, who cover it as, as, as professional journalists, that may not be the case. But nevertheless, we do have our poster child, um, approaching middle age perhaps, who is going to share some of his experiences. But I'm going to ask, start out by asking you, how does the climate today for startups differ from when you started back in 98, was it? 
so actually, um, my first startup in Hong Kong was started in 93. Okay. And uh, I was um, uh, 20, I had long hair, and uh, it was really difficult. And it was an ISP called Hong Kong Online. And uh, it was uh, back in the days when everyone was trying to set up a, an online service. And it really started when I came to Hong Kong, where nobody was using email. And I thought, hey, you know, we need to have that service. And the challenge we have then and now is that in the early 90s, we were still trying to educate the market about why the internet was even an, a good idea and why email was a good idea. Uh, whereas today, you have basically people who are much more, let's say, uh, knowledgeable about tech. They've seen other tech successes abroad and to some extent also just in China. So they understand that space. And also, I think it's a generational thing because the money was held at a time with a lot of family offices, which still is in Hong Kong, except that the generation back then didn't understand tech, whereas a lot of overseas returnees uh, have come to Hong Kong who are uh, used to tech, understand it, and are therefore much more sort of uh, engaging. And Hong Kong has always been a good end user in technology. So, um, how many rep We already had one question from a family office representative. How many more people are rep representing family offices here? Okay, that itself is a telling statistic. Um, when we were talking before, and I was asking you, how do you shake the money tree loose here in Hong Kong? Why there seems to be a dearth of early stage money for startups in Hong Kong, whereas all you have to do is you know, just plant a flag in China and the VCs flock to you. Is, are people really ignoring their own backyard here in Hong Kong? So I think the challenge in Hong Kong uh, has typically been that there's a very sexy, attractive neighbor just up north. And so when you look at it from that perspective and you have to deploy a large amount of money at start, then people look at the China opportunity, and that's natural. But I think uh, there is something that's being overlooked. Hong Kong does have a lot of money, and uh, in the angel funding scene is coming up in Hong Kong in a big way, much bigger than it was, say, a decade ago. Uh, because of this appreciation of tech, uh, because of the fact that there's more people coming from overseas to Hong Kong who look at Hong Kong as a lifestyle place, have good ideas, and get funded. Uh, but I think the challenge for the uh, Hong Kong isn't so much in angel funding as much as it is in Series A, Series B, basically the next stage. Uh, and that, I think, comes from the scale of the business and where its markets are. Uh, there's a lot of good ideas, but globalizing those ideas is a challenge. Uh, the other thing is, it's just a numbers game. You know, you, we, we talk about just, you know, you talk about planting a flag in China. Well, you know, China has a, a billion people. It's a very big place. Uh, from a ratio standpoint, I wouldn't necessarily say that China has per capita more success than Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is a smaller place and has its advantages. Uh, and there's also unique advantages that China has uh, in terms of a very local market, whereas Hong Kong is always a global market from the get-go, because you're competing with everyone. So if you can succeed in Hong Kong, then it's proof that you can succeed in the world. So it's maybe a higher bar, but if you can do it, you can be a global player. Okay, but the, the, the peer uh, factor is very important for startups, and it's sort of a chicken and egg problem here in Hong Kong. We don't have garages, we don't have basements, we don't have much space, it's very expensive. So you have to have, you have to either already be living here like Vicky, or you have to have some strong base to start from. So you're already closer to the bar. What about the, the, the true people who want to incubate something? Is Hong Kong really the right place for them to be trying this? So, it, you know, Every place. I mean, I don't think it's right to look at Hong Kong and say, well, let's see, look at Silicon Valley and take exactly what Silicon Valley has and copy it as a model, right? So every place has a unique model that, is to, that works to its distinct advantage. And Hong Kong has some distinct advantages. One, it's one of the ama most amazing global melting pots that are out there. Uh, in Hong Kong, you know, uh, just in our Hong Kong office, we employ about 200 people, of which more than a third are not from Hong Kong, mm -hmm. right? And that says something. You can't do that in China. Right? You can't bring people over from the US or UK or America uh, who have talent that you may want to bring in and have them live in, let's say, Chengdu or Shenzhen or even Shanghai with you know, all the issues that are there and environmental hazards, for instance. Uh, so Hong Kong has those advantages, and that melting pot effect is very strong here. Uh, the, so the other thing is cost as well. If you know, A lot of people say, oh, Hong Kong is an expensive place. And yeah, if you look at rental, it is. But the... 
uh, and salaries may seem high, but when you factor in the global marketplace again, when you look at competing against the US or Japan or Korea or global markets, Hong Kong isn't actually that expensive uh, and has, again, a global talent pool that you can put together. Uh, so I think Hong Kong has these unique, um, unique advantages, and it's very multicultural. So you can find talent here that can basically uh, uh, sell to the world. So you can design products uh, for the world, and you can already see that in manufacturing uh, and in other forms of, of, of production. They know how to do that, and technology is actually no different. It's just, we're not, um, I think there's a little bit of this Apple envy where people say, oh, we have to be on the front end of things, mm -hmm. when there's actually a lot of innovation that's happening on the back end that people don't see, like in areas of finance or back end enterprise and so on. And actually, there's an example of a local company founded by a Malaysian, mind you, uh, GDC, which makes digital projectors. And I just saw a story t that they have become the market leader in the US, overtaking the Japanese. So there are success stories. But they also, I think it's an interesting case because they're getting their funding from Unifung Capital, which was founded by Jack Ma. And his chief uh, investment officer used to work for Focus Media. And it, it, you sort of, if you look at China, you look at all the entrepreneurs who were enormous successes, and then they turn around and they're helping other smaller ones. Whereas in Hong Kong, we don't have quite the same sort of legacy as in China. And so the question that I have is, when are the people who have made their money in China going to start to realize that more, there's more opportunity here in Hong Kong than perhaps they realize? So, on, I think that first, um, not enough, if you look at Chinese investment capital, not enough Chinese investment capital in the tech scene is being wooed to Hong Kong. It's all going into property. Uh, well, yes, but that's for maybe very different reasons. Yes. Uh, and a lot of effort seems to be focused around trying to bring, you know, uh, the US or maybe to some extent European capital into Hong Kong. Uh, but there is a lot of Chinese money that is interested in investing in interesting ideas around the world. Because contrary maybe to popular belief, deals in China are no longer cheap. They're very expensive, in fact. Valuations are very high. Opportunities in China, the good ones, are few and far between. And of course, we see a few of the success stories, but there's a lot of them who are doing all reasonable, but, not, uh, but are not breakout. And we've seen many of those. So the, the difference here, I think, is that when we look at sort of the uh, opportunity for raising money, mm -hmm. uh, we're not looking enough, I think, for many of the Hong Kong startups uh, about what you can raise from China. Mm -hmm. China is often looked at as a market. How can I take my product and sell to China? Not so much what I can actually get from China to help grow an international market. Whereas the Chinese problem is, they already have a big market in China, they know that market well, but they want to go international. Mm -hmm. They want to go to the world. And that is an advantage Hong Kong actually has, mm -hmm. because it knows how to sell to the world. So you have kind of a little bit of this conundrum where, you know, where, where uh, many startups here, because they're Western educated, mm -hmm. or maybe they are overseas coming from Canada or, uh, or you know, Vancouver, for instance, or, or US, come here and their first thinking is, well, let me go raise some money from US guys or tap my friends from the US. And they're thinking, well, I want you to invest in China and grow that space because I don't know anything about it. I don't need you to sell to the US market. Mm -hmm. So that idea ought to be switched around. And I think a lot more opportunity can grow if, that was, uh, if we looked at that concept. Um, given the developments in technology, particularly social media, do you think that presents more opportunities? Vicky gave a great example of something that three or four years ago, perhaps, she wouldn't have thought of launching, but now it, it's that much easier. Uh, rather than Hong Kong having to perhaps create the next Apple and all the R&D that that involves, we are talking about startups here. Do you feel that there is actually more opportunity just because technology has moved on so much? Yes, I mean technology, one thing that technology has definitely done is it's made it a very equal playing ground. Uh, it's reduced the barrier to entry a lot. A good example is the app space. If you want to make an app, you know, anyone can do it. With a little startup capital and development, you're there. Right? Uh, the challenge, uh, I think, is that you're competing immediately with the world. And I think this is uh, you know, in some cases, when you look at the valley, it, it's a bubble in itself. So people are looking at each other and competing, and, but they've got a U.S. market that they're selling to. Mm -hmm. In Hong Kong, that market isn't big enough just by itself. Mm -hmm. So the companies that succeed in the space tend to be ones that go global right from the start, but they can develop it with a Hong Kong advantage. So. Do you think that chief technology officers get the respect in this town that they deserve? It depends where they work. 
Um, I think the represent the sort of if I look at a general how much technology has how much we in Hong Kong have become dependent on technology relative to the amount that's being invested relative to the power let's say that is given to CTOs of the respective offices I would say that probably by and large CTOs are not given the, the same level of let's say influence and power uh, because much of Hong Kong is still a consumer of tech as opposed to a developer of tech particularly for um, let's say family offices or for real estate or you know uh, even in the finance industry much of the development actually doesn't happen in Hong Kong and that's an opportunity because if a lot of more development happens in Hong Kong you create that sort of uh, development pool uh, so one 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 story when I started Outblaze in 98 we uh, our core of our engineering team came almost entirely from the Hong Kong Jockey Club and for those of you who, uh, who are not familiar with the Jockey Club it is the biggest betting center here and you all use it anyway uh, because they n know how to do massive transactions, they have to pour a lot of R&D uh, into making betting work in a scale that was you know, not really uh, typical. And you need more of that to create more of the talent that can develop that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and back then, it was really only the jockey club. Of course, that's changed today, but back then it was really only the jockey club that really had that many people in there. Sounds like the Bell that. Labs of Hong Kong. It is kind of like the Bell Labs of Hong Kong, um, but it's no longer as relevant today, just like Bell Labs. <laughs> um, I, I can't read the tweets. Could someone tweet me the time, please, so I know how many minutes we have left? <laughs> Rebecca, five minutes. Okay, let's uh, open it up. I hope there are some questions. Because I, you know, I get to ask questions all day long. That's my job as a journalist. Do we have any questions from the floor? Yes, we do, sir. Uh, right there. Um, yes, I see you. You have a stand up and here, do you want my microphone? <laughs> okay. And don't forget to tell us who you are, please. Uh, Andrew from Aftership. So I read the news that you got, I mean, you got funding from uh, VZ. So when VZ comes to you, so we, like VZ comes to us often. So what's the first few questions you will ask to pick the VC? And how do you pick a VC? Like if you want to go to China, you pick uh, IDJSL, for example. So what question will you ask? Thank you. So I would say it really depends. Uh, the VCs, uh, okay, let me, let me sort of look at this differently. The group level hasn't received any funding, but I think you're talking about the Animoca business, which spun out uh, and did receive uh, venture capital funding. In terms of questions that we ask VCs, I think the most important question is that we generally think about is, what do you want from the business in terms of, everyone wants an exit, but what are you looking for in terms of um, involvement in the business? Because in some cases, that can be good if you feel they offer a strategic advantage. In other cases, it could be an obstruction if they wanted to have too much control or they want to do things. Uh, and so there's a distinction between those type of VCs. A VC like sort of IDG or Excel uh, is very mature and they have a lot of experience in terms of the capital finance market, in terms of the structuring, and they give you certain advantages and give you open doors. But they're not necessarily going to be involved in operations. Uh, and that may or may not be a good thing depending on what you're looking for in contrast to a strategic investor who will probably be much more involved in the business and wants to look at more aspects of the business to help you, but could also be interpreted maybe, depending on the development of your business, as interference. So I think the stage in which your business is in, and frankly, how much equity you're willing to sell, is gonna determine that relationship. So it's not, it's not a straight answer because it really depends. But... Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, and then, sir, over there, we'll get you in a minute. Oh, so thank you. So actually, I'm from the uh, one of the interview of Cyberport, and uh, RBS is some stock trading software. And uh, now in Hong Kong, we have 4,000 customers. So my question is, when do you think is the best time to scale to other places like China? Because now we have some uh, customer base in Hong Kong, and uh, but uh, we are not very sure when is the best time to scale as the topic of this conference, uh, because uh, we can where did the product here, where did the market channel here, uh, so but what's the best time? Yeah. How big is your dream? Mm. <laughs> so uh, because you know if we scale to China too early, it will use too much resources. But uh, if sorry, we, that's yeah. not my question. Yeah. My question was, how big is your dream? I think uh, big enough to the world. <laughs> then you should start right now. Oh. 
the the thing I think the uh, and this is a, I think this is a typical Hong Kong uh, or Hong Kong example, and we go through this a lot with some of the angels we invest as well, where because they don't have access to a lot of venture capital or it's difficult for them, they have to think in terms of cash flow, which is true. I understand. Been there as well. We didn't have any venture capital when we started uh, a long time ago. So you think about the business in terms of making money immediately, and that's good and bad. It means that your business is sustainable, but it frankly also means that you're capping out because you're basically holding yourself back. If your dream is big and you want to conquer China, the present is already too late. And that is for any business if you have a big plan because someone else is probably thinking about that idea and execution is probably 90% of your success. So if you're thinking, I need to be stable, I need to be ready, right, then it's very hard to basically get there if someone else raises a lot of money and moves there. But there is a risk, right? So, for some people, and we see this also in the gaming space, in the app space, it's a lifestyle. It's still a successful startup. It makes good money. It funds their lifestyle very, very well, and that's okay too. You don't need to have a startup that must have, you know, million a billion dollar exit. So okay. it's all relative to that. Let, let's yeah. try that last question. Somebody had a hand up over here. It, we've only got about a minute, so be yeah, I'll be quick. Concise. Hi, my name is uh, Maximilian Newbegin Watts. I'm from Obelisk Education. Um, you've talked briefly about how when you, you, you started in the 90s in Hong Kong, how things were very, very different than the internet was in the startup phase. Um, so going forward, how do you see the advantages uh, that you discussed about Hong Kong? How do you see that going forward in, say, the next 10 years? I mean, you have the, the cities like Shanghai, particularly within China, um, their tech tech industry is growing tremendously. So how do you see Hong Kong maintaining that advantage in the near future? So I don't know that it's fair to compare Shanghai and Hong Kong in terms of who has what advantage, because I don't think, like in business, uh, a city needs to carve out its particular niche. And I don't think Hong Kong's niche is going to be to compete with Shanghai. They're very different. Hong Kong is a gateway to the world. Shanghai is a gateway to China. And the two of them need to be looked at, I think, in that perspective. And to that extent, I think the unique advantage that Hong Kong offers is a neighbor like China, but the world really at its fingertips in terms of opportunity. And because you develop a product here, uh, it's not going to be a place where you're going to hire, for instance, 10,000 staff. This is not possible in China. So you can't think in those terms. But if you think in terms of sort of high value R&D, um, high value development, uh, mixing melting pot, I mean, melting pot, sort of different cultures is where you get great ideas. Getting someone from Africa, getting someone from America, getting someone from the UK working together, new cool stuff can come. Um, and you see this in different forms, whether it's architecture in Hong Kong, whether you see it's even in the finance business, there's a lot of innovation. Textile is a good example. And technology will go in that direction as well as more people move in that space. But it's all selling to the world, not necessarily just selling to China. I think we have time for another question, particularly since the audience questions have been so good. So uh, yes, here uh, about the fifth row in the middle. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chipper Boulis, uh, angel investor with Firestarter. Um, you talked uh, quite a bit about the ecosystem of, for startups in Hong Kong with respect to uh, capital uh, and some of the difficulties, especially at the Series A, Series B rounds. Uh, could you comment on the ecosystem uh, in, you know, concerning uh, st startups' ability to get support, expertise, uh, net networks opened, uh, you know, some of the mentoring, uh, how much of it is here, is it lacking, is it overabundant, how do you see that? Now, okay, maybe, um, maybe I'll, I'll sort of answer the question this way. The, because Hong Kong is a global place, frankly, your audience and your, um, your sort of um, advisor base isn't necessarily just in Hong Kong. So if you look at it from a global standpoint, and if you're comfortable with communicating online, then frankly, your advisor could be sitting 6,000 miles across the ocean. And I think that's something that uh, the, those that have advisors, whether it's friends or whether it's board members that they've brought in, many of the advisors are from overseas because they bring those ideas. Hong Kong, of course, has advisors here. Um, but again, your friend network, that's how it starts. Uh, and if you don't have that network, then you go to conferences and you have to go out there. And part of the, uh, the challenge, for, especially for those who are really into tech, they don't necessarily want to go out and meet people. 
uh, they're, you know, introverts are developing, extroverts want to go out, but somehow they need to be able to match both. And that's the hallmark of a good entrepreneur is that he can do both. So that is more, I think, a notion of that entrepreneur. And if he's comfortable with that, he'll travel the world and he'll get all the contacts he needs. Uh, you know, because you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have LinkedIn, and even some of the sort of most successful entrepreneurs, you can tweet them directly. If you've got something interesting, you'll get their attention. Well, we probably could have built the entire program on these first two tech chats. There's so much information, so much content here, and I really want to thank um, Frederick and Napoleon for moderating. They did a superb job. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. And I love that. How big is your dream? I think that's a good question. Thank you.